Hey guys, I'm Steve Freeman. On today's episode of the Steve Freeman Podcast, we are talking to my buddy, Big Vinny, from the Trailer Choir to The Biggest Loser. We're going to talk about his journey in the music business, his huge weight loss and journey through The Biggest Loser on television, and what he's up to now. You don't want to miss it. All that is straight ahead on today's episode of the Steve Freeman Podcast. You're listening to the Steve Freeman Podcast, the real, raw truth about the pursuit of success in music, business, and life. Here's your host, hit songwriter, multi-platinum selling producer, and serial entrepreneur, Steve Freeman. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Steve Freeman Podcast. So good to have you here. While you're here, don't forget, rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Rate us five stars on iTunes, Apple Podcasts. Make sure you're following me everywhere on social media at The Steve Freeman. And join my inner circle. You can do that at thestevefreeman.com. Get occasional tips and tricks to help you be successful in your music career, in your business, delivered straight to your email inbox. And as always, the podcast brought to you by the Artist Development Academy. Get the information, access, and guidance you need to be successful in the music industry with the Artist Development Academy online courses. You learn from the people who have been the most successful in the business. It's just amazing. We're having a blast over there. Go check it out. ArtistDevelopmentAcademy.com. I've been looking forward to this episode for a while now. I've wanted to have Vinny on because I think he is one of the most inspirational people that I've ever come across from what he did with with being successful uh, with the trailer choir to then realizing uh, his health was an issue and being almost 500 pounds. He went on, went on the uh, the biggest loser and did very well, not even from the context of even talking about the show, but I'm talking about the man lost over 200 pounds, almost 300 pounds and is now healthy has an amazing family, an amazing growing business. He's got a brand new single out. Um, and so I wanted to have him on the podcast to talk about it. So it is my pleasure to welcome my buddy, Big Vinny. Big Vinny, it is good to have you here. Thanks for taking out the time, man. I, there's so much I want to get in uh, with you about uh, today. But first of all, how are you and the family doing with all of this self-distancing and social quarantining? Well, you know, it's it's kind of funny because having a two and a half year old and my wife's pregnant as well, you know, we don't really go out to bars and different things. I mean, about the only thing we really do here in the week is maybe, I mean, we go to our gym every day and then we go out to eat every now and then. So, I mean, we're not, we're not like out at bars and partying and doing stuff anyway. So it's not a huge difference for us. I think the biggest thing is um, our gym had to close so we don't get to train our clients and all that kind of stuff. So the, you know, we've definitely lost a ton of money and of course with me not being on the road and all that, but as far as the time we're getting to spend together is awesome. You know, the slowdown is actually something that's, you know, I mean, our family's already really close anyways, but getting to spend more time with the family and uh, not leaving out on the road every weekend is definitely, uh, it's been kind of a cool, cool thing um, to be able to slow down a little bit. Yeah. We've kind of been talking about the same thing around here too. And it kind of feels that way. I, I was telling somebody a little earlier, I feel a little bit guilty in that, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not feeling the effects that a lot of people are feeling. And, and, you know, a lot of people talk about the negative side of the music business and it's like, however, if you've been doing it right for a little while, we're, some of us are not feeling, uh, this impact. And, and other than I thought I was a homebody before, and now I'm realizing that I wasn't as much of a homebody as I thought I was because it's like I, I, I realize I don't go out and do a lot, but you can't even like go to Target. You can't even just get out. And it, that's the frustrating part to me right now. Yeah. And I think with me just being very cautious with uh, having a pregnant wife and sure everything, you know, we, we're definitely taking more precautions than, you know, probably most people our age, which I now, now some of the new studies are showing it's not as, uh, different for younger people either, but I don't let her go to the store. Like I go and get our groceries. I go and make sure that she has what she needs for the baby. And, you know, we're also trying to get our nursery ready and all this other stuff. And it was all things we didn't necessarily just have already. Right. Um, so we've been going to buy, buy, I've been going to buy, buy baby and other places to pick up some, you know, some much needed things. So we get ready for this new baby coming in June. So that's awesome. Well, congratulations on that. It's, it's, uh, 
I love following you on Instagram. If, if, if by the way, if everybody, it's right there on your screen. If you're not following uh, Vinny, you need to. It's at Big Vinny Mac. That's two G's, uh, no E. <laughs> uh, it's right there on your screen. Go follow him. I love, I love seeing everything uh, that you're out there doing. And I, I be, I've become a thing. I don't like the word hustle anymore. I don't like the connotation that it puts out there. But I, I, I've, I'm kind of adopting the new word grind. And, and it's, that's one thing that I appreciate so much about you, um, is I think in, in this world that we live in now, if you do not have the ability to constantly reinvent yourself, then you're lost. And that's one of the things that I think, you know, people in the music industry, they, they, they want the fame, they want the success, they want all that, but it's all predicated on one single definition. And they, people put so much into that that they don't know how and can't reinvent themselves even when they get to that point and then start to slip. And and the people that are, are the ones that are really going to to stand out. And I'm constantly amazed at how you reinvent yourself, not out of necessity, but out of knowing that this is the next phase of my life and I'm going to transition into that. Yeah. I think it's, it's growth, you know, I mean, as you're growing, as you're changing, you know, I, I came into this, music industry. I wanted to just be a writer. I had no plans of being a performer, entertainer, never thought I would, you know, kind of do that path, but butter, you know, butter, he convinced me that I was supposed to do that, that I wasn't just a writer. Cause I thought, well, I'm 450 pounds and I'm, you know, don't look like, you know, everybody else and all that other stuff. And he said, that's what makes you great. And uh, so at 22, you know, we signed that record deal. And so I had to reinvent myself on that because it's like, like 22, you got the record deal, you're on tour with Tokyo Keith, you're doing all these things. Now, wait a second. It didn't quite pop past the, you know, the radio test, you know, as you'd say. So now it's like, okay, how do I now continue to have a career when all that other stuff disappeared? Mm. And that was a, that was a cool test. And it was a hard test because I was so used to be like, Hey, here's your tour bus. Hey, here's the tour with, you know, 60,000 people watching me every night, you know? And so when you go from that to like, okay, now I got to figure it out. I got to go back to the bars. I got to go back to the, you know, the casino boats and things like that. How do I do it? And how do I do that without having the major production around me and all the other stuff? And I really, you know, grinded out and learned how to be a better, you know, acoustic performer and things like that. Uh, took it back to the music, to the song, to the lyrics. Um, because I was known for being this big breakdancing, crazy, entertaining guy. And I still do all that, but it's like, it's kind of cool now that I can sit down with just me and my guitar and, uh, stop people in their tracks the same way I did when I was 500 pounds and doing the pop worm and crazy stuff like that. Well, I remember, and, and we did not, we didn't meet that night, but I remember it must have been 2006, 2007. And it, I was, as I used to, I don't anymore, but I used to go down every year at CRS, the country radio seminar yep. and, and, uh, and trailer choir was performing at some, one of the venues. I don't even remember which one. My legends of our- it probably was. And, and I remember sitting there and watching you guys. And I was like, what the fuck am I looking at? I, 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 th- this is, th- this is either the, the, the worst thing anybody's ever going to see, or it is the absolute best thing anybody's ever going to see. Yeah. And I remember Looking at the response, because I always gauge things like that by looking at the crowd. I, 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 I'll watch the stage and I'll watch the artist for a minute, but then I look around to see how other people are responding because my response doesn't matter. You know, nobody gives a shit what I think. So I'm interested to see how other regular people are, are responding. And you guys just struck a chord with people. And it was almost like uh, there was an attainability factor to trailer yeah. choir that did not exist. That buffer, it seemed like was gone. It just seemed like there were, at that time, there were three of you and there were, th- well, I'll say you and Butter seem more approachable, but yeah. that was, that was the allure of it is though you, I, I looked up on the stage and I thought, wow, there are two people that you could just generally be friends with. And yeah. that translated really well. I think that was probably our biggest thing is just the endearing factor of like, People wanted to hang out with us. They wanted to party with us. And we did that, you know. So when we got on our first tours, we weren't even supposed to be on the tour. So Live Nation had no clue that Toby said, hey, get on this tour bus. You're going on this tour with us. So we show up to all these venues and we're like, where are we playing? He goes, I go in the parking lot, find somebody to play for. So our whole first tour was literally just me and Butter and Crystal on a golf cart 
we took the battery out of his Montero Sport, took jumper cables and made it into an adapter so we could plug in our guitar and our microphone and sing for all the, all the tailgate parties. We just nice. found a way to make it work, and people love that. And so, therefore, when they did start coming to see us on the stage, like, hey, didn't I see you in the parking lot last year? Like, yeah, and there's like, yeah, that's awesome that you are now getting to play on the big stage or the side stage and this and that. So, um, but yeah, that was, I think that was one of our biggest things is that people felt like, man, these are the guys I want to hang out with. You know, these are the guys I want to come, you know, come to my barbecue and um, things like that. So we, we definitely loved that aspect of what we were. And then, of course, the show was crazy over the top. You never knew what was going to happen. I mean, we, we did shows where we had Steve McGranahan, World's Strongest Redneck, come out and been frying pans and rip, rip, you know, phone books and things like that. And then I tried and I couldn't do it. But, um, but you know, we just always, we had a Forrest Gump impersonator that would come out on our stage and do crazy stuff. You know, we, we just always wanted to make it a show, you know, because it's like I can go listen to a record and listen to somebody sing and play their song and I can listen to the song and every lyric and hear everything perfectly. So what are you giving me that's different when I show up to see you play live than I could just listen to on on your record or on your Spotify account or whatever? Right. And I think that was always our main focus. We started off as a frat party band. So when we started putting together the songs like Off the Billy Hook and Rockin' the Beer, it's like, what are we replacing out of that cover show that people would want to hear? So how are we replacing Sweet Home Alabama with an original? How are we replacing, you know, Save a Horse, Ride a Cowboy or, or Jesse's Girl or whatever? How are we replacing those songs with an original? So we wrote songs and we, we created our songs based off of what our show was going to be more so mm-hmm. than what... Um, you know, we were as probably a group. It's like, how are we going to entertain crowds with our original music? Right. Well, talk me through a little bit for those of the, the people that don't know. Uh, Trailer Choir was signed to uh, Show Dog, uh, Toby Keith's label. Tell me a little bit about that and the hard work that you guys have put in to finally get the recognition and how all that came about to get Toby's attention and, and to get on Show Dog. You know, I, I think for us, it's probably a way different path than most people because Utter had been, you know, grinding it, you know, hustling, grinding, however you want to call it. Uh, he had been here since he was 18 and he went to college at MTSU. And when we got our deal, he was 36 and he looks like he's still 10, but um, he had been here for 18 years going at it, grinding, making things happen and all that kind of stuff. So everybody kind of knew who Butter was, that he was this crazy dude that was a little bit different than the norm. You know, he was a five foot six you know, a little, you know, firecracker dude, you know, so everybody knew him. So then when we put trailer choir together, I met him one night at my office. I caught him sneaking into my office out of his because we shared a door in a duplex. So I caught him sneaking into my office. He didn't know I was there at like four o'clock in the morning and he's coming through my side door to go eat all my peanut M&Ms and drink my diet Coca-Cola. So I, I, I see him walking through. I said, Hey, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I've been caught. He's like, man, he goes, I'm down to my last little bit of money. I ain't hardly got nothing left. And I was just sneaking over here because I knew you had all these m and these Diet Cokes. And uh, he said, man, I'm just trying to, you know, to, you know, get some food. So I was like, all right, man. So we sat down and talked, became friends. Next thing you know, he invited me to a show at the Bunking Up Pig. I started dancing in the crowd. He got me up on stage and we kind of developed this crazy show. At the time, we had a fiddle player named G-Ray uh, who was 16. He was our third member. And he was insane. He was one of the best fiddle players you'd ever hear in your life. But he just kind of um, decided to go his own way. And then literally Crystal, the night that Toby saw us, uh, Crystal was hired to be a backup singer. But we were at 12th and Porter. So back then, the stage was just very you know, small. So it looked like we were free. Yeah. And so he wanted, when he decided he wanted to sign us, he said, man, I want all three of y'all. But the way it happened, really more than anything, is that me and Butter were playing five or six weekends in you know, we, we played Music Mafia, which we were blessed with. And the next day, we'd be playing the Billy Block show. Then we had our own show at Fuel that we played on Thursday nights. Um, then we'd randomly pop into every, everything we could jump up on stage at. And then on the weekends, we were playing frat parties. So every Friday and Saturday night, we were at, you know, somewhere in the SEC most of the time playing a frat party. And, and on those frat parties, we went from starting off at like 600 bucks, 700 bucks a night, making like 3,500 bucks a night because we became in such high demand because it's like this crazy spectacle of a show. Um, and so Bobby Pinson, if you know Bobby, he, he started kind of watching us and liking us, and we started renting his little bus truck thing we had, had made out of an old uh, moving truck. We started renting that. So one night we were playing the Billy Block show. We get done playing. Billy Block says, hey, Toby Keith's in the back and wants to talk to y'all. And Pinson just, just, just thought we were 
this crazy thing that would make sense on Toby's label, on Toby's tour. Um, and before that, you know, actually Scott Bruschetta came out to see us. Karen Curie brought Scott Bruschetta. He told us he loved us, but he thought we should go to L.A. And we were like smash mouth for bare naked ladies that we weren't really probably going to have a chance at country radio, which maybe he was right out. Um, and then, we, you know, we had several other labels to check us out as well because we started filling in between 300 people in the 12th and quarter every time we play it, you know. And so we just built that crowd up. But um, the thing I always tell people is like, like, they always say, if you, you got to be in the right place at the right time. And my response to that was, well, if you're more places, more times, mm. then you're more likely to be in the right place at the right time. So that, that was just, it was just running, playing, you know, four or five shows in town every single week. Uh, you couldn't, you could not see us somewhere every week. Of course, now it's different. I mean, now there's meaning. There's 30, 40 shows a night in Nashville. You know, it's not. Usually there was just three or four venues that, you know, you had to get on to play the, the Billy Block show or, you know, luck up to Music Mafia, something else, somebody invited you to that, or, you know, just a couple other little showcases you could do. You know, obviously there was open mic night, and, you know, put your name on the list and hope you get to play Bluebird or whatever. Uh, but now it's like there's, I mean, there's so many. I mean, I have a weekly show, there's Whiskey Jam, of course, two or three times a week now. And uh, I, I don't know, every bar has it, uh, a night now, so... No, it does. It seems like that. And I tell, I would have rather, I'm glad I was a part of the the class that I was because I couldn't imagine it now. People's attention spans are too short and there's too much availability. Yeah. You know, I, yeah, it's definitely, I think, I think, you know, even with what's going on right now, realizing how important the connection on the internet with your fans, you know, are and, and being able to do these live shows and uh, some of these things that people are having to do now, these streaming shows, uh, I believe is going to become more and more popular. But now we're, I mean, we're in a time in the music industry when you're not going to get signed based on your talent. You know, you can be the most talented singer in the room and, and that's great for you. And, and, you know, but if you don't have something different to offer, if you don't have something to bring to the table that, you know, either is a major fan base or you're one of a kind, something like, you know, and really you've got to bring a business that's already working and then they'll give you a record deal and they'll take you to the bigger waters, but you already have to have that ship built and sailing, you know, before they're going to, pick you up and say, Hey man, I believe in this. You know, there's no more, Hey, I'm going to develop you. I'm going to put you right. out there. Work with you. you know, very few times does that happen now. And probably only if you are bringing your own supply of money to push that. Well, totally. Um, I tell, I tell new artists all the time, getting a record deal now is like getting a, a, a loan from the bank. You have to prove to them that you don't need it before they'll give it to you. Yeah, and, absolutely. you know, I, I tell my my catchphrase these days is, you know, everybody wants to jump on a moving train, but nobody wants to shovel the coal to get it going. And, yeah, no, you know, that's and, and it's, you know, a lot of it, too, are a, a lot of artists are just lazy. Uh, they're not willing to do what you guys did in the early days to go out there and play for no money and to start building up the awareness and, and doing what it is that you have to do. Yeah. To, to literally shovel that coal to get that attention. And yeah, you, you build up that initial crowd that's going to be your inside champions that are going to talk about you every day. They're going to go out there and tell 10 buddies that tell 10 buddies, you know. Right. And that's really where we're at in the industry now. I mean, you look at, I'll give you a great example. So I do, I have another group called Nashville Cartel. It's myself, a guy named Jared Blake, you know, Jared, who's on first season of The Voice, and then the original lead singer of Saving Able, Jared Weeks. Um, we tour together. This is a guy, Jerry Weeks is a guy that has went out there, has been Grammy nominated, multi-platinum selling artist, has had the number one song in the country in 2010 with Addicted, all these things that he's done. And he's humble enough that he'll go out now and say, hey, man, we're going to go out here and we're going to get 800 bucks a piece or a thousand dollars a piece, which has led us to $20,000 shows that, you know, we're not necessarily famous enough at the moment to really be getting, but people like us so much that these people come in and say, hey, I don't care. I want y'all to come do this. I'm going to pay you this money. Come do my Christmas work. Do this. I think that's, you know, because we're out there grinding, because you're out there going out and play this show, which we're probably going to lead to another show. And um, I think a lot of people, they want the fame, like the work. And, and the thing, thing I just, I, just, I love, I enjoy a little bit of fame, fame that we have with um, choir and loser. Uh, but what I really love is music. I love to perform. I love to put on a show. So, so, Regardless of what ever happened, I'm always going to be an entertainer. I'm always going to be a performer. I'm always going to be a singer and a songwriter. So how famous I am at any given time doesn't determine if I create music or if I'm a musical person. That's just part of my life. It's part of how God made me. 
And so, you know, I do a, a, this showcase every week with a lot of young artists. And you know, whenever one of them asks me, like, how do I get famous? I get that question a lot. You'd be surprised about that. I mean, if people are more concerned about that, I said, the way we're going to get famous is by being you and doing exactly what you love to do in music. If you don't really love music, if you just want to be famous, then I suggest you get on TikTok and YouTube and all that kind of stuff and make funny videos that you can hopefully go viral with, which you know, we all kind of know if you get in the industry long enough, there's just viral and then there's actual viral. You know, I mean, you can right. create something that seems like it went viral. And so, you know, if you look at, for example, uh, what's his name? Blanco Brown, with that song to get there. That's a real viral something that's moving and doing great things. And we're doing the dance on the talk and it got huge. Well, then Broke O and B and G come in and come in and say, hey, wait a second. We want a piece of that. And 625 million streams later, you know, it's you know, making them millions and millions of dollars off of one song. No, I mean, that's now the truth. Now they're getting 30, 40 grand a night to go and really just show up and do that one song, you know. Right. What a phenomenal singer he is if you really get into his music and I mean, he hit whistle tones and everything else. You know, I can't do any of that stuff, but our talents are different, you know. Yeah. Well, I want to kind of segue and talk about The Biggest Loser, because that was a major pivot for you. What, for, for anybody that may not be familiar with that journey, as far as you're concerned, I know that you were over 400 pounds during the whole trailer uh, choir thing, through the label, through the shows, through everything. What was it that was that brought you to a realization that it's like, I've got to change something? And how did that decision lead into the biggest loser? It's kind of a, an interesting string of events. So I, uh, I had accomplished so many things at such a young age. I mean, I was only 27 uh, whenever the biggest loser opportunity came around. So I'd already been touring for five years from 22 to 27. Um, you know, I'd been on the road with Toby Keith. I had opened for ZZ Top. I'd done all these things. And the moment that, that something hit me that I was, there was a little something off in my brain, we opened for ZZ Top at Sturgis. And I was so excited. About it. I was like, I can't believe we're going to do this. This is amazing. I guess it's going to be the coolest thing ever. So we opened for ZZ Top. And there's 60,000 backers out of that Buffalo chip that are watching us that, you know, that love us. You know, and ZZ Top was standing on the side of the stage just watching us play. And I get done, and I was like high fiving you know, those guys as I'm walking off stage and go back to the bus. And then I sit down on the bus. I'm like, well, what, what, what do I do now? What's next? How do I top that? I wasn't proud of the things that I was accomplishing because I, I was still running from things in my past. So I just wanted to know what was coming next. What was the next thing I was going to look forward to? You know. And then of course you get all hyped up because you got a song out, and you get home Monday from you know this great weekend of shows and crushing it and talking to radio guys and all that stuff. And then you get back and, you know, the record label's like, well, we didn't get no ads this week, guys. You know, I, I don't know what we're going to do. I'm like, well, well, we just went out there and crushed the show. People love this. We sold, you know, $20,000 in merchandise. I mean, something is going on right here. But all they would be concerned about was that radio. So that kind of bothered me. So then I started thinking, like, okay, well, what else can I do? And I started thinking, I'm going to go to L.A. I took over Nashville. I'm going to go to L.A. and I'm going to be a major actor. I'm going to take over the world. I'm going to be the next Chris Farley. And that's what was in my head. And so I was luckily attached um, through a person we wrote with named Sue Sandberg with uh, Cindy Fairley, who is the Fairley brothers' sister and their lawyer. And they were getting ready to do Dumb and Dumber 2 the first time. You know, not, not the one that actually was coming out, but the first one they had. So I went out there to audition for a part uh, with her and she had me in her office, which was this huge office in downtown LA. And I got up there and I talked and told her all about me and I did the worm and I you know, did all these things and played some guitar and sing for her. And she's like, I get done. She's like, Oh my gosh. She's like, I love you, your personality. I love how bright you shine. She's like, I really think that you got a chance to do this. I said, like, well, that's awesome. Let's do it. Put me in the movie. She goes, but <laughs> she's like, I think, that you don't realize the difference in camera. She goes, when you're on camera, you're going to be so huge compared to these other people because you're almost 500 pounds. You know, for somebody like you standing next to a, a regular sized person, it just doesn't look right in the frame, you know, in the camera. Because now we can use those, we can use people like you in certain things, but you're going to probably be the guy that runs through the speedo for a comic relief moment, you know, a slapstick kind of thing. She goes, I want more for you than that. I would love to see you be like Chris Farley. I said, well, Chris Farley was huge. He goes, he was about 300 pounds. So, you know, he's still 200 pounds lighter than you are, you know, wow. and, 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 you know, just, just completely, and was a phenomenal actual improv comedian. That was what his background was. So 
differently than me, which was this kind of large character that was, you know, larger than life. I didn't have the comedic skills that he had, you know what I mean? So comparing myself to somebody that was lifelong in it was kind of a stupid thing to do. But at 20, 26, 27, you don't know, you're just, you want to be what you want to be. So she told me to go home and lose some weight and that she would keep me in mind and that you know, they might look at putting me in the movie somewhere, this or that. But she wanted me to kind of focus on losing some, some weight, not, not getting small, but, you know, losing a couple hundred pounds would be closer to 300 pounds, 280, 290. So I got home, I was, or I was getting on, on a flight to go home, and I was having a real bad pain in my leg. And I thought, I looked it up on WebMD, I thought I had a uh, hernia. And so it wasn't. I get to uh, get homeland. My girlfriend at the time took me to the hospital, made me go. And the doctor gets looking at it, and they told me that I had what was called cellulitis in my leg, which was caused from my type 2 diabetes that I didn't even know I had. Wow. So I'm sitting there close to 500 pounds. I think at that point I was around 490 or so which was probably about my heaviest weight. And they take me in and they say, hey, you know what, you're extremely obese. You got this and this and this going on. Your liver's swollen and your kidneys are swollen. And I mean, they did a test for hours on me. And um, they said, it's not, you know, what's, what's happening in your leg is just a small piece of what's really going on. I was like, okay, so I need to lose weight. They're like, yeah, you need to lose weight. I was like, okay, cool. Well, give me a diet. I'll, I'll go on and lose weight. She goes, well, no, we're taking you to surgery right now. I'm like, immediately? She was like, yeah, if we don't get the infection out of you right now, she goes, you would lose your leg within the next two days. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And I, that scared me to death because I'm like, I thought I was invincible. I thought there ain't nothing going to get me. I'm Big Benny, you know. And so I learned real quickly that I wasn't, um, I wasn't you know, <laughs> immortal like I thought I was. And they took me in. They cut this huge hole about that big in my leg and pulled out all this infection and put in the hospital bed for about six days. And on about the sixth day, I get a call from a girl named Dana DeSilvio, who I was a girlfriend of mine at, when I first got to Nashville, and she was on the first season of Biggest Loser. And she asked me, she said, hey, I got, I've got an audition for you from Biggest Loser, front of the line pass, because I want you to go on it. She didn't, nobody knew I was in the hospital, because I was so ashamed and embarrassed, I didn't want anybody to know. I didn't even call my mom. Wow. Like, I didn't want anybody to know. And so... Sure enough, um, I get off the phone. My girlfriend at the time said, you need to call her back. You need to go audition for this show. And I did. And then I got immediately called back. I mean, I didn't even get out of the out of the casting place where they did it at the memorial uh, before I got a text message that, hey, call this number. And I called the number and they said, hey, we really loved you. Uh, we love your story. We'd love to have you come out to L.A., you know, and, um, you know, audition for the show for the final auditions. And so I did. I went out to L.A. and then they had about a hundred of us out there that they brought out and um, finally selected me down to the final 15 to put me on the show. And uh, really, for me, the process of deciding to make that pivot was caused because I gave myself a disease that was going to take my leg. And being a guy, if you've ever been around Toby much, you know, that the page, you know, patriotic you know, the way you treat our military and stuff, you've got to treat them top notch. And all I could think about was all those guys I met that lost their legs because they were out there fighting the war mm. to keep me safe, to keep me be able to eat whatever I wanted to eat and do whatever I wanted to do. And here I was about to lose my leg because I ate myself into that. And I couldn't, I couldn't handle that. And that was what really made me decide that, Hey, I got to go do something different. Man. God gave you a body that is functioning, that you have talents, you have all these things going for you and you're just taking it for granted. And so you're going to have to take this time now and do something different. And that was where I made the decision. I'm going to go and change my life forever. And I went and faced the demons of my childhood, things I went through. I, went through. I grew up in a very hard childhood, and I faced those demons, and I forgave the people that hurt me and all that. And that's what really helped me get the weight off and keep it off. And, you know, now I'm eight years later and still going strong, baby. <laughs> well, I, I, I did. how much weight did you end up losing total? So total on the show, I lost 184 because I'd already been on the diabetic diet for several months before I went out. And I was about 453 when I left the house to go out there. Uh, I weighed in on the show at 426 was my first official weigh in. So I had already lost like, like 75 pounds. You know, 70, now I got to I got to ask you when you could you tell a difference in the way that you felt with even just that, say, going from 490 to 427? Huge, huge difference. I mean, you, really? You, I mean, yeah, you look at that. I mean, that's, I mean, some people barely weigh over 100 pounds. Right. I mean, um, so, I mean, total, I lost about uh, 211 pounds from the time that I actually weighed in when I went for the show, 453, which was when I actually knew how much I weighed because before that it was kind of a guess because the, the scale only went up to like 
450 pounds, really. So they were guesstimating another three pounds. Um, so I didn't have a scale that would weigh me. Even at the hospital in Columbia, they didn't have one that would go over that. So it was a guesstimation on how much I weighed at my heaviest. Or around, they figure it was around 490 or so, um, what the doctor said. And then, But I was 453 whenever I left for the show. Uh, and I lost all the way down to 242 at my lowest, so about 211 pounds. And uh, wow. right now, I mean, currently weighing right about 300 pounds. And um, but I've spent the last eight years of my life trying to get bigger and stronger and powerlifting. And um, I don't know how much muscle I've added, but I know that my strength is insanely more than it was whenever I came off the show. Well, that was one of the things that I wanted to ask you about. Was so you lose all of this weight. What what made you decide to go into more of the lifting and and the bodybuilding aspect of it and to to gain weight back, but in a healthy way? It, it, I don't want to say one extreme to the other, but yeah. but here you were this per, and you lost all of this weight. And then it's like, now I'm going to focus on the bodybuilding. What what was how was that for you? Was it just a part of getting in and doing the exercise and you realize, man, I really like this as a lifestyle? Yeah, yeah. That, that's part of it. I think one of the big things for me is like I realized even at, after losing all that weight on the show, eight hours a day of working out, eating perfectly clean, all that stuff, my body just really stopped at about 265. And I had to push so insanely hard to get under 265. So 265 was kind of where my body really wanted to live. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do then? If I, I ain't ever going to be a little skinny kind of guy, I'm never right. going to be a ripped up six pack dude unless I go into the bodybuilding route and then really focus on building the muscle up to fill up that area. So I, I was just kind of doing, you know, four hours of workouts every day. And I thought that was the right thing. And then I ran into this guy at the gym named Seth Cab. And he said, Hey man, you're the hardest worker I've ever seen. You pull that tire and you come in here and you work out and you crush it, man. And you leave here, not, not an ounce of you ain't soaked in sweat. He goes, I said, yep, I'm the hardest worker, man. That's what I, I pride myself on my, on my grind and how, how hard I push. He goes, yeah, he goes, but you're also the stupidest worker I've ever seen. And I was like, what? And I didn't really know the guy at the time, you know, but he's this big old ripped up bodybuilder guy. He's like, listen, man, he goes, you have so much strength. You have so much natural ability. He goes, your chest is naturally so big and your shoulders and all this other stuff. He's like, let me teach you how much you should be eating. And he asked me how much I was eating. I told him I was eating about 2,400 calories a day, which was what the show had me on. And he goes, well, look, he goes, that's fine. He goes, that ain't going to hurt you. You're not going to lose a bunch of muscle with that. He goes, but you're not going to gain anything. He's like, so if you really want to get bigger and stronger, he's like, let me teach you. So he put me up to like 3,400 calories a day, like a like thousand more calories a day. Uh, and then he said, I want you to stop doing insane amounts of cardio every single day and all this stuff. He goes, I want you to come in. I want you to get up every morning, go do a 20 minute walk, get done with that, eat breakfast, you know, let it digest and go to the gym for an hour. He goes, you know, do 45 minutes of, um, you know, your lift, you know, 30, 45 minutes of a lift and then, you know, 15 to 20 minutes of light cardio afterwards. And, uh, he goes, that way your blood's oxygenated and you're already going to have your heart rate up. So you'll be able to stay in the fat burning zone for 20, 30 minutes. He goes, and then I want that to be all you do. He goes, and at the end of the day, if you want to go a walk or do whatever, do that. He goes, but don't be getting your heart rate up all the way up and all the way down, all the way up and all the way down all the time. He goes, we'll do some hit training sessions every now and then for 20, 30 minutes, but you're overworking your body, which is increasing your cortisol levels which is going to make you hold fat, which is going to make you not, you know, get, gain any muscle and your, your body's going to be cannabolic instead of anabolic, mm. which means it's eating itself. You're eating the muscle. So I was like, what do I got to lose? So I jumped in with him and I said, I'll give it a month. And in that month I dropped from about 265 back down to 242. I think 238 was my actual lowest. And you could see, you know, even eating that much more food and doing the workouts like that, you could see my six pack start to come in and you can see the, my body changing. Um, now where the problem came in is I was comparing myself to the guys that were professional bodybuilders mm. and I didn't realize that all the steroids and all the different things that took place in that. I just thought that's how they were because they worked hard, you know, now they do work hard still, even, even on the steroids, they have to work hard. Just right. I don't want that to be a misconception. Um, but I was kind of comparing myself. So I was like, well, I need to get bigger. So that was when my mind said, I'm going to eat more. So I bumped up to 5,000 calories and I started working out harder and trying to get my weight heavier and all that kind of stuff. And I did that and it definitely started increasing that. And I got up to about 265, 270 um, doing that. And I was still lean and, and looked great and all that. Uh, and then about two years into that, I found Strongman. And Strongman was where I really wanted to go. I, like, I just loved it. I was infatuated with the sport. 
um, how these guys were, you know, picking up a thousand pounds and moving it, you know, not just picking it up, but moving it. Right. And so that kind of, that just enthralled me. And I, I fell in love with the sport and I started kind of training for that. Um, and I was on my way to do my first competition this past June when I snapped my perineal tendon in my left ankle oh. and that sidelined me. So, uh, but to do that, you know, I got up, you know, those strong men, they, they get up in the 400 pounds, but they're 400 pounds and you can still see their abs. Right, you know, right. Now, they're also about six foot seven, six foot eight, most of them. So I started thinking I was going to do that, not professionally, but just for fun. And I got up to about 320 at my heaviest. Um, but again, I was in phenomenal shape, you know, even at that weight. So, um, but yeah, I think it's just all the different ways. Like you said, I, I like to change with the times. You know, I guess I see something I like. I want to try it. I want to go for it. I figure like you only get one round, you know, on this world, you know, to kind of do the things you're going to do. Um, so as long as my blood numbers stay good, as long as my health is in place, I don't care about the weight. Um, I don't necessarily care about how much fat I carry um, as much as I do. Do I have diabetes? Is my, you know, do I have high cholesterol? Do I have high blood pressure? And, you know, every few months I'll go get a physical and I'll get blood work done. And all that has remained and stayed phenomenal. And actually my cholesterol is too low. So wow. I've, uh, I've had problems getting life insurance because my cholesterol, my LDL stays at about 22 to 30. And uh, which is insanely low. It needs to be closer to 100. Um because that's what creates your testosterone and other things too. So there is use for your for your LDL. It does help things in your body. A lot of people are like, well, I'll get it as low as I can, but there are reasons that it needs to be in your body too. So, man, that is, that is awesome. I, I it 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 has always been your story in that regard has always been so powerful to me because the commitment that it would take for somebody to make a decision, lose over two hundred and something pounds, and not just lose the weight, but then go. Now what? Now I'm going to live healthy. And that's a that's a big thing. Losing weight and living healthy, two totally different things. Completely different. And educating yourself on what is actually healthy versus what society tells you is healthy. You know, society tells you that this guy with a six pack who's ripped up, that's healthy. But honestly, he might have high blood pressure, terrible cholesterol, all these other things because people's bodies process things differently. I, I know a guy that played bass with us for a while, Chris Shepard. The guy weighs 135 pounds. He was an all-SEC rugby player, which is crazy to think of the guy being 135 pounds going to play rugby like that, but he played for Auburn. And, you know, he would come on the road with us. This is right after I come off Biggest Loser for a couple of years. He traveled with us. And, man, he'd show up with a dozen donuts, and he'd go to McDonald's, and he'd get everything he wanted to eat. And he's like, man, I just eat whatever I want. I never gain weight. He goes, I, never, I just always stay ripped up. And I'm talking about you could see every piece of muscle in every part of his body because he was so lean. And he calls me one day. He's like, Penny, I need to talk to you. I'm like, what is it? He goes, man, I'm, I'm in bad shape. I was like, what's wrong? He's like, my blood pressure through the roof. My cholesterol is so high. They're like, I'm borderline diabetic. And he goes, I have all these things going on in my body. I was like, oh my gosh, I would have never thought that because his body type doesn't show it. You know, so there, there's three subminal types that people call it. There's endomorph, ectomorph, and, and mesomorph. A mesomorph is a guy that, you know, or a girl that pretty much just stay muscular, natural build is muscular and, and leaner but they can gain some fat and a lot of muscle. An ectomorph is a person that stays skinny no matter what they do. They can eat all the food, they can do anything they want, they just don't gain weight. Assholes. And then there's endomorphs like me that I can gain a ton of muscle very quickly, but I can also gain a ton of fat. And it's a hard balance to find the, the medium parts of those. And then obviously a lot of people are hybrids of two, you know, a couple of them. So sure. for me, I definitely carry a lot of mesomorph because I have longer arms and naturally, you know, big features in certain ways. I don't have the short stubby arms, but I do have the very rounded midsection, you know, and that's just kind of the way I'm built. Um, so learning the education of what is truly healthy versus not, and I learn still stuff every day. You have to be open to continue to learn. Um, I think for me in the beginning, I thought I knew everything. Come off Biggest Loser, I know everything about health and fitness and everything there is. Um, and then as you get out there, you just realize like, you know, you went through six months of learning. Other people have been through 30 years of learning, 30 years of experience, because experience, you know, I mean, you can go out there. I mean, somebody that's good at taking tests can become a personal trainer in two weeks. You know, they can go take the test. They can get the certain certificate. That doesn't mean they know anything about lifting weights or how to help somebody that has a messed up hip or a broken ankle or, you know, there's just so many things that go into that. And then when it comes to the, the food side of it, there's no one size fits all. There's some people throw out keto all the time and other people say you got to be vegetarian. And other people say you got to be vegan. 
Some people say you need to eat six times a day and some people say three or two or, you know, intermittent fasting. There's just so much information out there. And honestly, you have to find what works for your body because it might be different for you because you have different hormone imbalances that somebody else does. You've been through different things, your blood type. There's so many things that can affect the way your body processes different foods and different things, you know. So it's it's a it's a huge learning experience, you know, to go out there and learn all that different stuff. I love it because I, I write meal plans. If you've seen it advertised, a company called V Shred. Um, mm. Me and my wife both work for this company, and people always assume that they know everything that they need to do and that they should do. Um, and we have to really customize things to fit certain people. You know, you got people in Alaska that you're saying, "Hey, you need to go out and you need to get all these vegetables and all these fruits and all these things." They're like, yeah, well, that's not available here. So what else can I do? Right. You know, people, you know, we, we deal with people from uh, Australia and people from the Middle East and people from India. And I mean, we get people from all over the world that we write these meal plans for and learning like, hey, we don't have access to those things, but we have all the seafood in the world. You know, right. we eat sea urchins every day. I'm like, wow, well, we saw that on, uh, on uh, Survivor. And I never thought people actually ate those things. So right. you know, I've definitely learned even just from writing meal plans for that company, uh, how different cultures in different places have to have different foods, you know. Right, right, man. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I need your. I need to get, get you to help me. I want to lose about twenty five pounds. I get you to help me. My problem is though that I don't want to exercise. <laughs> You'd be surprised that it's probably not your problem. Most people's problem is that the food that they put in their body, because you can lose weight without ever. I mean, you can walk. You don't have to go and do all these crazy workouts and all that stuff. Honestly, it's eating whole foods. The first thing I tell people when it looks like stop eating anything out of a box, stop eating anything that's, you know, even some canned stuff, anything frozen, you know, eat whole foods that are, that are just real foods. You know what I mean? If you do that first, that's the first thing I do for people. It's like, I'm not going to come change everything on you. I just want you to, if you're going to eat breakfast and you want to have oatmeal and a banana and you want to have five eggs, have it, you know, that's fine. But don't go have oatmeal, banana, five eggs, two or three bars, that, you know, a, a bar that you think is good and healthy for you or this or that, anything that's a processed food, you know, boxes of cereal, like, oh, it's healthy cereal. I'm like, is it, you know, how much sugar right. is it? How much of are you eating? Are you actually weighing out the portion and knowing how much you're putting in your body or are you just pouring a big old huge bowl and eating 800 grams of carbs in the morning? Um, and it's also, like I said, once again, learning what works for you because it might be different for most people. But I, I would say most people, the first thing they got to do is, no fast food, no processed food, no Coca Cola, you know, or right Coke or Pepsi or whatever, you know. And that that doesn't even mean that means even no uh, no no diet ends either because there's so much bad crap and all that. And uh, and then alcohol, you know, in Nashville especially, you know, we're up, we're we celebrate by do, using alcohol. We get down or something don't go our way, we use alcohol. We you know, we'll hang out with a friend or have a, a lunch meeting, we use alcohol. So that's the biggest thing that I have to focus with people that I work with here in, in locally is cut back your drinking, you know, mm. do it only on a real, an actual special occasion where you had a number one or you, you're, you know, celebrating somebody's, you know, 40th birthday or something like that. But don't, don't find every excuse in the world to go out and drink because that's what I did with food. I was that I don't drink at all, but with food, it was like, Oh, I'm down. I'm going to eat. Oh, I'm happy. We're going to eat. Oh, I'm celebrating. We're going to eat, you know? So I use food as that for me. And uh, thank God I don't, I don't really do that anymore. I mean, I stay on a pretty, strict plan because of my goals and what I want to do. And um, luckily, even through this, you know, because I'm a co-owner of our gym, I'm still able to go in the gym and, and work out and lift weights and uh, do some of that. We don't have any cardio equipment at my gym because it's just a lifting gym, but uh, I've still been able to keep up most of my regimen on what I do. So, Right. Well, what Although does... What, eggs, all the eggs are sold out at my grocery store. So. No, I know. Everything's getting sold out. It's getting ridiculous, but... Let me, what does, what does the future look like for Big Vinny? I know you've got a brand new single out. It's called The Good Life. Um, it's available everywhere. People don't go stream it. Go buy it for Christ's sakes. It's 99 cents or $1.29. You know, he acts like you're slapping yeah, somebody's grandma. Still, go buy it and then still stream it. Yeah, buy it and stream it and, you know, buy copies for other people. So you, yeah, you, you, you're still doing music, obviously, like you're saying, I've, 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 I've seen everything that you've got going on there. You've got the new single out and then you've got the fitness stuff. Tell me where all of that combines. What, what does the future look like for you? What are you focusing on? Yeah, I think for me, my ultimate future, I believe, is in motivational speaking because I, it will be my fitness will help lead me towards that and keep me in the realm that I can do that. 
Um, and I can still perform my music while I'm doing that. Mm. It gives me a different platform than other people uh, because I want to tell my story because I know it's going to help somebody. You know, because my story isn't just the weight loss. My story goes back to my childhood and the trauma that I went through. And um, I had a very abusive stepfather uh, that beat me and my brothers to where you could barely walk sometimes. So that's the story I want to tell because that's what led me to be 500 pounds. Because I thought if I ate more and got bigger and stronger that he could hurt me. And then I became an emotional eater because of that. So my story is called I Love Me. And that's what I'm, I'm writing a book right now called I Love Me. It's about loving yourself enough to go after the things that you already deserve that you don't, you don't believe you deserve because you didn't love yourself enough to believe you deserve it. And so my whole book is called I Love Me. So that, that's my future, I believe, is uh, speaking to crowds, sharing my story, sharing my music with them. You know, always, I'm always going to have a record. I'm always going to have a new song. I'm always going to be doing that because that's who I am. Mm. Um, but I think the encompassing overall part of me is that I want to speak. I want to help people uh, believe in their self, you know, and I would love that really for me, I love doing schools. I love doing, you know, talking to kids um, because I believe that's where it starts. If you can, if you can like the, in the Bible, it says if you plant the seed at an early age and even if they get away from it, they'll come back to it. You know, mm. So I want to plant the seed of loving yourself into these kids. I want them to know that, Hey, you have to wake up every morning and no matter what your circumstances or your situation, you have to believe that you can come out of that, you know, because I didn't believe that when I was a kid, I thought I was going to be a poor white trash, you know, abusive step. You know, I, don't, I mean, I think what I really thought I was going to be, but I, I think that was in my mind is like, you can't be anything more than what you came from. And, uh, and I want to challenge that to everybody that I talk to is like, stop blaming other people for where you are at, you know, where you are when you're 16 or 17, you may not be able as much control of it as you can be. When you're 25, 30 years old, 40 years old, and you're still blaming what happened in your childhood for where you're currently at, um, then you're messing up your own life. Mm. Because it doesn't mean it doesn't affect you on a daily basis, but it means at some point you've got to step up and say, I'm going to change it. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to be a different person. I'm not going to let that control my life anymore. Um, and I've, I've, talked, I've talked in schools uh, up in Cleveland that were predominantly black that when I walked in, they were like, who is this? You know, I got called every name in the book, walking to the stage, right. You know, but by the end of it, I was able to get the kids to realize from my point of view and what I grew up in and what I went through is not so different from some of the things they face. It may not be exact, but it's still the struggle. It's still the, the hard times, the things that you got to overcome. And I think my biggest goal in life is to teach people to overcome those things. Uh, realize that you're never going to be perfect. That it doesn't mean that you're not going to struggle again. That it doesn't mean you're not going to have another mountain to climb, uh, but giving you the tools that you need to help climb that mountain each time that something does get thrown in your way. Because people wake up every day and find out they got cancer. It's not something they knew was going to happen. You know, it's not something they could plan for or anything. But it's how you react to those things. It's how you, you know, what I call mastery. You know, how do you master that? How do you get over it? How do you get past it? And, you know, obviously there's going to be times in your life when you're, you're not able to get over them. I mean, obviously things like that are, are way different than uh, weight loss and different stuff. But um, every, every single problem, there is some kind of solution or some kind of at least positive attitude you can have towards that. And you can learn from it. Uh, and that's what I try to do is find the positive and everything. And like I said, not saying I don't have bad moments or this or that, but I, I'm, I would generally wake up. Very excited, very happy about life. You know, even, you know, this, this pandemic we're going through right now has already cost my family probably $35,000 just in these first three months, just in March, uh, April and May. Um, and, but I'm trying to be like, hey, you know what? I get to spend more time with my family. At least I was blessed enough to have some money put back to are saving to buy a house um, that I'm okay right now. You know, I've got a lot of friends right now that have no clue uh, where they're going to make money from. You know, they're jumping on Facebook Live and putting up a tip bucket. So I try to tip it two or three of them a night if I can and help them out, you know? So it's just, how do we get through those problems? You know, and at the end of the day, there's always going to be a way to get through it. And, uh, and for me, that's always been God. So, you know, Jesus has been in my life, my whole life. And, and it, even at the worst, darkest parts of it, I feel like he's been there with me. So. Man, that's awesome. I can't, I can't think of anybody better that would be to, to send into a school, uh, you know, to talk to people about, their future, their, the current status of where they are and how they can overcome everything. So I, I think that's such an, an amazing plan that you've got because you've got a great story, man, a story that everybody can relate to. And the, the funny thing of it is that, that translates. I was saying earlier about how I felt when I saw the trailer choir the first time that it was so relatable. And that just has, that common theme has run all the way through your life. And, and I think that, that God is going to use you in amazing ways for that. 
I appreciate that, man. It's it's really important to me and, and also to be that example for my kids. You know, I want to teach my son, you know, how to love everybody and how to treat people with respect and kindness, even when you don't agree with them. Um, you know, I think we live in a world now where everybody is, you know, everybody's a reporter. Everybody's an expert on everything and all that kind of stuff. And to me, as opposed to arguing with people most of the time, I'm just going to I'm going to sit back and say, hey, man, you know, I, I disagree with you, but I still love you and you have the right to have your opinion. You know, and I think you've dealt with some of that, you know, lately, Little. some opinions you've had. So, um, and, and it's tough, you know, because a lot of times people misunderstand because they get so emotional and that reaction happens mm. before they listen to everything that's being said. Um, and I used to be that way really bad. I mean, I'm a reaction, reactive person because of everything I've been through in my life, but also just because I'm, I'm a creative person. I want to say what I want to say and I'm, yep. I'm loud, you know. And so it, even with my wife now, who is amazing, um, she's sitting over there too. Hey, girl. <laughs> um, she taught me how to slow down, how to be like, hey, wait a second. Let me finish everything I'm saying and then respond because I might be answering a question that you're going to ask me before you ask me that question. Right. You know, and so, and she's taught me to do that. And it's been great having somebody that can add to your life and uh, help you be a better person. And she definitely does that for me. And I think everybody uh, could slow down a little bit, listen to, listen to somebody else for a minute, understand where they're coming from, because we're all born and raised different ways. We're all come from different backgrounds and different things. So to automatically assume that you know what's best for somebody else's life, you know, is it's hard to say. And also, if you're trying to, you know, if you if you if you're fighting for something you believe in, it's because it most of the time makes your life better or increases your quality of life on this earth. So, if you're talking to someone that is going to that's going to change their quality of life on this earth to a lower quality of life, then why are they going to agree with you? You know, so how do you how do you combat those different things when we all come from different walks of life and from different parts of the world? You know, so. well, and if we all thought the exact same way. And we all had the exact same pen, opinions. What a boring place this would be. Well, would you, yeah. Well, I think I think we would we would you know we'd be bored to death as opposed to other things. But I mean, obviously, there's some things that are just moral. You know, you can't hate somebody for their color of skin. You know, you know, and things like that. I mean, if you if you do that, then that's that's on you. And hopefully, you find forgiveness for that. Um, and maybe there's a history or something that pushes you to be that way. I don't mm-hmm. know your story. Um, so I don't cast judgment on people automatically for how they believe, you know, because I don't know what they went through. I don't know what, you know, things that have happened to them as a kid that may have made their mind believe a certain stereotype or a certain this or that. Um, for me, I grew up small town, Tennessee, Perry County, Tennessee, born and raised. We didn't have no culture. It was just basically all white people in my town. So only thing I knew outside of my race and outside of how I grew up was whatever Hollywood showed me, you know, or whatever I saw on the news. So you start believing, well, that's how it is in L.A. or that's how it is in New York. And then you get up there and I end up going to New York. I'm like, holy crap, there's more country stuff in New York than there is in Tennessee. I got to upstate New York. It was beautiful and there were so many trees and farms and all kinds mm-hmm. of crazy stuff, you know. And you get out to California and realize that Los Angeles is not California. You know, there's so many other places there. And so getting more culture definitely was a huge thing for me to get out there into the world and see other places and meet other people and other, other religions and other races and other things like that. I think helped culture, uh, me to, to other people and, and made me a more loving, caring, uh, person, you know, overall, because I could understand stuff from somebody else's point of view. Um, which I think anybody that can, you can get some of that in your life is definitely a huge help because we do only see things from our point of view, mm. from what we live, from how we were raised, you know, well, I think, you know, we're all a sum of our experiences and Absolutely. The, the better, the, the better, more rounded people that we can be, or we, we will get those things through the different experiences that we have. And, you know, I see way too many people close themselves off. And yeah. that's why I, even in music business wise, I think that's why we don't have superstars anymore because they get so isolated and their experience almost reaches a ceiling and they're not experienced to everyday life and everyday people. And therefore the art becomes less interesting. And I think it's a big funnel that works that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy. You know, I feel like that really started happening. Probably like in, in 2005, 2006, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know that there's, you know, I know that some people think that certain people are superstars right now because they're currently famous. Um, but are they going to stand the test of time? Are they going to be Toby Keith? you know, 25 years from now, 30 years from now, they're going to be George Strait, you know, or those type of people, you know, will, will they you know, transcend and become Justin Timberlake? I don't know that. 
you know, it's hard. It's hard to say. I, I think I do. And I, and I think the answer to that question is no. Uh, I think because the society that we live in right now, I've said it a million times. I think most people in the entertainment industry it doesn't even it just have to be music industry, but in the entertainment industry, people because of the social media world we live in are more interested in the perception of fame than the reality of success. I, I agree with that. And it's what have you done for me lately? I feel like. Oh, it's totally. Like, it's not the sum of your works anymore. It's like, oh, what are you doing right now? Are you currently a big star? Because if you're not, then you're not a star. You know? Well, and we live in, a, in the business now. You can be relevant in noon and completely irrelevant by 5 p.m. I mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've seen it. I, I mean, I, I got friends right now. You know, I'm, if you've heard of this band called Why Don't We? Um, they're a new <laughs> upcoming yeah. boy band. And they're good dudes, you know, and they're, they all come from. Uh, I think some of them are on X Factor or one of the other shows and they kind of put them together and they're just phenomenal, you know, little dudes and they're out there blowing it up and doing great things, but they don't feel like they're famous at all, even though they're filling out six, 7,000 mm. person places every single night by themselves, you know, as the headliner. I'm like, guys, y'all are, y'all are killing it. You know, I don't know what kind of deal you've got worked out, but you're, you're doing, you know, great things. You know, you just got to stand up, but all they can look at is, well, we're not on the radio. We're not currently at the top of the charts. We're not this, we're not that. I'm like, yeah, but guys, you're at the top of the sales chart. You're at the top of the, you got almost 6 million uh, Instagram followers that are real followers that are not fake. And every time you get on a live on Instagram, there's 6,000 people watching you. Right. I've seen people with double the amount of fans you have go live and have a quarter of the amount of people you have That's right. watching. You know, the, the, you know, you're looking at fake numbers, and, you know, so many times and it's, it is tough, but yeah, you're, you're right. I, I it's, it's, you know, right now, I think the biggest guy in, in country music is probably Luke Combs, um, if I had to guess. And, and I, I love the dude. So. I think that he's uh, he's crushing it. Um, what will he still be crushing it 20 years from now? You know, Florida Georgia Line a few years ago, um, they were everywhere and everything all the time. And I'm, I mean, they still are doing great, you know, but they're definitely not as prominent at this moment as they were six or seven years ago, five, five six years ago. You know? Right. And I no, love them. True. I think they're great dudes. I think that they're, you know, they're, uh, they're hard workers and they came here with the dream and went to college and did, you know, to follow the path and did everything they had to do to make it. So I respect that. And I also respect that they always thank Jesus Christ every time they get an award or anything. So I was yeah. watching the award show a few years ago and they were literally the only ones I've ever won that got up there that, that um, a lot of them said, thank the guy up above or thank the big man upstairs or this, or that, but they were the ones said it was, Say thank you to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for without Him none of this would be possible. And I just think that goes a long way with me. When you're mm. um, no matter what you sing about or no matter what you do, you're not afraid to share your faith. I think is a big deal for me. But um, but yeah, who knows? I mean, who knows if those guys? I mean, they they've obviously been very smart with their money and put it in great places to continue making money. And they're already in that you know sixty seventy million dollar um, net worth range, which a lot right. of people work through. I think Tim McGraw's net worth is probably in six, you know, that same range. And he's been doing it for 30 something years, you know? Right. So he's, yeah, they're, they're doing something dude. right. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're I, I, reinventing I, themselves all the time, man. Their new record, the new last thing I heard almost a country, that new song they got is super country, you know, mm. I think they, uh, and I love that they support other artists too. They're out there working with my buddy, Kanan Smith. And, you know, I had a cut on Kanan's uh, last record that he had with uh, um, Universal, I think. And, um, uh, man, they support him. They take him on the road with them. They, they didn't just sign him. They sign him and say, Hey, we're going to put our money where our mouth is. And we're going to sign you, take you on the road with us, make a record with you. We're going to post everything you put out on our social medias and tell our fans to love you like we love you. Mm. And I think that's important. You know, I mean, you look at Kelsey Ballerini, I mean, girls, phenomenally talented, sweetheart of a girl. Um, the song was failing. It was about to flop and Taylor Swift put out one tweet. And sold 127,000 downloads overnight. Yeah. You know, so that just goes to show you, you know, the power of influence that some of these people do have uh, in, in, a, in a short amount of time. That doesn't mean it's going to last forever, you know. But I would say Taylor Swift is probably our last, in the country music industry, probably our last superstar, you know. I, I, I yeah, I, I, I don't know who's, you know, I don't know who's going to fill those shoes. Um, and I, and, but I think it, it's because of how we... Th- there's right. at least six to six pairs in, in each world wardrobe changes. So. Yeah, exactly. So they, there's a lot. No wonder nobody's going to be able to fill them. They can't figure out which ones to put on. But yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it is going to be interesting to see. And I think with what we're going through right now, I think is even going to change our industry forever. Um, um, it's, it's got, I mean, it has to, because 
you know, I've been looking last night. How many times have you seen Brad Paisley go live on Instagram before this happened? Yeah, never. 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 But look at, look at, I mean, they, I mean, there's a lot of nights they've closed Instagram down because so many people going live and, you know, Miley Cyrus is doing a nightly show, yep. you know, which I think is good in some ways because she's helping brighten her fans day and, you know, talking to them directly and bringing them on screen with her and all that kind of stuff. But I think we're going to see this not, this is not going to go away now that it's happened because people are realizing like, Hey, this is, this is a real way to really connect with your fans um, to make them feel ownership mentality in what you're doing and love you forever. You, you get a fan on there, my, you know, Miley Cyrus, for example, just because she's such a big star. She brings a fan on there and she talks to them for, you know, two or three minutes and they get to be on her page and everything else. Mm. While the, she's live. That person will fight to the death for her. Forever. From now on. Forever. There's yeah. nothing that anybody can say or she could do to make them that well, you know what, that one time she was so sweet to me. And I think that's why Taylor Swift is who she is because I watched this girl stand for 10 hours yep. at CRS, you know, CMA Fest one year and just talk to people. Yeah. Sign autographs and hug necks and, and talk, you know, share stories with them and all that kind of stuff. And Garth Brooks was obviously the master of that first, you know. Well, isn't it so, funny though to you that Everybody, and especially new artists and and even labels, we can throw labels in there, keep trying to find the secret sauce that makes up the Garth Brooks and the Taylor Swifts. And it's very easy to see. It's the ones that did that. It's the ones that did stay four and a half, five hours, six hours after and shake every hand. It's not the ones that want to be so famous that they think what makes them famous is the buffer between yeah. them and their fans the the illusion and all of that it's the ones that actually do seem like and act like normal people it, you know what's funny is i've got to have conversations with both taylor and north and i've asked them the same question i was like you know what is it that makes people love you so much and north and her said the exact same thing almost it's a little different wording but basically what they said was i'm a bigger fan of the person walking up to meet me than they are of me Mm. Yeah, and that was almost Garth's exact words. He goes, "You know what? I just try to do, Vinny." He said, "I try to every person that's taken their time, that's used their hard-earned money, to come out and see me play, or bought my record, and that." He goes, "If they come up to meet me, I just want them to know how thankful I am that they gave me the opportunity to do what I love." He said, "So I'm a bigger fan of the person coming up to meet me than they are of me." Wow, and that's always stuck with me. And I'm, I'm that way too. You know, I'm, I'm never obviously I'm not never become the star that they have, but you know, anybody that's been our fans that's come to our shows know that I'll I'll hug every baby and shake every hand and hug every neck and I love doing that you know and and it's part of uh, it's natural personality for me anyways it's not me stretching to be right. there I'm naturally that kind of a person you know and so I well, do know it's harder I've been, I've been on the road with some people um, and it's not that they don't want to be that way but just naturally they're either germaphobic or they they have anxiety disorders or different things like that I think a lot of artists suffer from that because. You know, artists are finicky creatures, some of us, you know, especially the super artistic people. I'm not necessarily a super artistic person. I'm a creator. Um, I have a quick mind and, and all this kind of stuff, but I'm also kind of have a business mind. So I'm kind of a hybrid of the situation. Uh, some people are so artistic that they're really reclusive, like they're, they're, mm. they're naturally that way. And so to expect them to be a certain way, they're just never going to be that. You know, it doesn't mean yeah. that they won't have fans. Um, but they're not going to have the mass following of the ownership mentality that people carry for Garth Brooks. I mean, you watch when people started attacking Garth Brooks over not singing live. I mean, I mean, they come out in droves. Don't you dare talk about Garth Brooks. Right. That's Which, right. I'm one of those guys. Garth Brooks is my all time favorite. I mean, when I was a kid, I wanted to be Garth Brooks. You know, I mean, I was, everybody else was talking about Johnny Cash and Waylon and all that. And I love all those guys. But I'm like, I want to be like Garth. I want to put on that show. I want to jump off fire burning ropes and bust out of a piano. <laughs> you know, I want to set the whole stage on fire. You know, that's kind of how I was. Um, but, you know, that, that's, that's something that gets me. And I think a lot of the world wants to be entertained more so than sing to. Because you can sing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can sit with the guitar and I can sing and I can keep your attention for probably 30 minutes. But at some point you can be like, okay, what else is there to do? Right. But if you look up and it's like, oh my gosh, this dude just busted out of a piano and now he's swinging across on this on a rope ladder and now he's doing this. I wonder what he's going to do next. You're not taking your eyes off the stage. You know, the best example I can give is Circus Soleil. If you've ever been to a Circus Soleil show, you can't not watch because you don't know what's going to happen. Like, You're going to miss something. Even I, I went and seen a couple of different ones more than once. And even though I'd already seen them and I knew it was coming next, I still couldn't take my eyes off the stage. Right. And I think what Garth, I've seen Garth probably four or five times now. 
And even on the last tour that he did, you know, and you can kind of see where certain things are scripted and all that when you've gone a few times. Um, but you still watch. You still can't stop looking at him because he knows. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you one more story because this is – I was at Garth Brooks' uh, Songwriter Hall of Fame induction. And that's when I really – the first time I got to meet him, I got to meet him a couple of times. But I asked him a, another question that day. Uh, they had us do a panel, and Scott Bruchetta was running it, and I got to put up my hand and ask him a question. And I said, man, I said, you know how you do that thing where you open up your eyes and it looks like you're looking the entire crowd and all of the eye at the same time? I was like, well, how do you do that? He's like, I feel like you know how to look every single person in the eye at the same time. And uh, I said, what was the first time that made you open your eyes like that or made you do that? And he said, man, he goes, she, I was 16 and I was at the local pool and so-and-so with the life card. I was like, and he goes, no, I'm just kidding. He said uh, he goes, I went to see Queen in concert, and I was standing in my chair the entire time. He said, people wanted me to sit down, but I couldn't. I was standing up in my chair just hoping that Freddie Mercury would look me in the eye. He goes, and as I'm standing there with my eyes wide open, he looks me right in the eye. He goes, you could feel the energy explode from him to me and into the whole crowd. He said, so when I'm up there, he goes, I go around every single venue, and I go to every, every part of the venue to see how is somebody going to be looking at the stage from this point and from that point and from the furthest way away to the closest one, to the one to the far off obscure right or the left or behind me. He goes, and I just try to make sure that, that I find the one person that's waiting for me to look at them. And I, I, I find their eyes for even for just a second and explodes and it creates the whole crowd. The energy blows up from there. You know, he said, and so he goes, the first time it happened to me, I knew that I, that was what I wanted to be as an entertainer. So. Wow. That's, that's, that's pretty amazing. That's the difference between an artist and an entertainer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, you get to I that mean, level. Those are entertainers. Some people, love, some people love Bob Dylan and they think he's the greatest songwriter of all time. I would rather listen to anybody else, but I respect the fact that he's a phenomenal lyricist. You know? Right, right. No, I'm the same way. Yeah, totally. Well, man, I don't want to I, take I up too much more I, of your time. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not the best person to question anyways, because I love... I love music and I, I love all the different genres and styles. And I think it takes so much talent to do any of them, you know, oh. whether you're a DJ or if you're a phenomenal songwriter, if you're a spoken word artist, you know, I, I respect all the different talents. It doesn't mean that all of them are my cup of tea or that I'm going to listen for a long time, but I still respect the talent that it takes to do it. I can't stand screaming Megadeth raw music, uh, but I'm, I couldn't do that for 30, for 45 seconds without losing my voice. So however they're doing it, they're talented at what they're doing. So. Well, man, I appreciate you having me on the show. I, you know, I follow all your stuff, and you know, I love what you do, and I think that you help a lot of young artists, guys and girls. Uh, I think you help a lot of young artists, you know, make their path through this and show them that there's more ways uh, to make money and, and be successful in the industry than just getting the next record deal or being on radio. And, and we all love radio; we all want to be on there, but it doesn't mean that you can't have a career just because you're not one of those that gets picked mm. to be on there. So, so true. Man, thank you so much. Again, you can find his new single, The Good Life. It's available everywhere you buy or stream your music. Uh, go get it, buy it, and stream it. Share it with somebody. You can find him everywhere on social media at uh, Big Vinny Mac. That's B I G G V I N N Y M A C K. Go follow him if you're not already. And Vinny, as soon as this thing's whole, this, this, whatever the hell it is we're going through, this pandemic gets over and we're allowed to, to be social again, let's go grab some coffee or something, hang out. Heck yeah, man. I'm all in. That's going to do it for this episode of the Steve Rubin Podcast. Thanks so much to Big Vinny for being here. Don't forget, go follow him everywhere on social media at Big Vinny Mac. And while you're there, follow me to at the Steve Freeman across all social media platforms. Don't forget, rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Give us those five stars and visit artistdevelopmentacademy.com. Guys, until the next episode, keep being creative, keep pressing the boundaries, and there's nothing wrong with being independent. See you in the next one. Thanks for joining us for the Steve Freeman Podcast. Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and follow Steve on social media at, at the Steve Freeman.